In John 5.39, Jesus says the scriptures, in context meaning the Old Testament, bears witness about him, that it is all about him. With that interpretive key in mind, today I'll examine how the prophecy in Zechariah 9 looks back at previous Old Testament works and looks forward to Jesus and the church. In other words, I'll illustrate how the Bible forms one cohesive narrative despite being written by dozens of different authors over a period of many centuries. The following teaching is taken from my weekly interactive Bible study. The text is Zechariah 9, 9 through 17, in case you want to grab your Bible and follow along. Stay tuned after the message to learn how you can join in the discussion next week. So what I thought I would do today is look at how our text looks forward to Jesus, but also looks back upon earlier scripture as a way of showing that the Bible forms one cohesive narrative, despite being constructed over centuries by dozens of different authors. So on the surface here, we have a rather unremarkable event, someone riding into town on a donkey. No doubt this happened many times every day. Yet, by the time of Jesus, the symbol was so well known that the crowd celebrated Jesus' entry, recognizing what was happening. How did this come about? For starters, the passage is clear prophecy. Zechariah is writing about future events, and the king language is a clear indication that the passage is messianic. Scholars generally agree that it's likely that a list of what they call testimonia or signs of the Messiah circulated among the people of Israel. And in the Dead Sea Scrolls, we actually have evidence that these verses were among those signs. But interestingly, this idea doesn't actually originate in Zechariah, but rather in Genesis. In Genesis 49, 10 through 11, we read, The scepter shall not depart from Judah, nor the ruler's staff from between his feet, until tribute comes to him, and to him shall be the obedience of the peoples, binding his foal to the vine and his donkey's colt to the choice vine. He has washed his garments in wine and his vesture in the blood of grapes. The combination of royal imagery, donkey, colt, and foal suggests a very strong link between these two passages. Interestingly, the image of being uh, washed in wine is not carried forward to Zechariah, but of course in the New Testament, being washed in Christ's blood is a strong theme. Going back to our passage, we see that the king is righteous, that he is actively bringing about justice. With his justice comes victory or salvation. Uh, nonetheless, the king is humble. This is a word in the Old Testament that's often used of people afflicted with great burden. This, of course, is all an apt picture of Jesus. The daughter language here uh, shows the parental nature of God. Don't think of it, the daughter of Zion, as being some inhabitant of the city of Zion or the daughter of Jerusalem being an inhabitant of Jerusalem. Rather, it's referring to the city itself. If we put in, say, city of Zion, this is pretty clear. In the original language, it's saying that the daughter is Zion, the daughter is Jerusalem. So God's children cry out for joy at the salvation brought about by the king. A very similar cry occurs in Zephaniah 3, 14 and 15. Sing aloud, O daughter of Zion, shout, O Israel, rejoice and exalt from your heart, O daughter of Jerusalem. The Lord has taken away the judgments against you. He has cleared away your enemies. The king of Israel, the Lord, is in your midst. You shall never again fear evil. So here, the king is directly linked to Yahweh. The Messiah is the king. The Messiah is Yahweh. The Messiah is none other than God incarnate. Genesis to Zechariah to Zephaniah, the testimony is all about Jesus. Verse 10 is not quoted by the Gospels. And now perhaps this is because they saw only a partial fulfillment in their time, with ultimate fulfillment coming in the second coming of Jesus. And throughout the Old Testament, we see a conflict. Will the Messiah be triumphant or will he be defeated? 
the text seems to suggest both at different times, sometimes even in the same passage. A number of theories to explain this were developed. Uh, some Jews thought it was conditional that one would ha or the other would happen depending on Israel's level of obedience. Others thought there would be two simultaneous figures, uh, one being the suffering one and one being the triumphant one. Still others expected the same figure to come twice, the first time to suffer, and then again later for ultimate victory. Uh, that, of course, is what we as Christians see it now. But it's important to realize that we didn't invent this theory to justify our belief in Jesus, as some novice critics like to assert. The language here is uh, signifying the reunification of the northern and southern kingdoms. But it goes beyond that. This phrase from sea to sea marks the promised bounds of Israel from the Red Sea to the Mediterranean. The river is the river Euphrates. That's why it's in capital letters. Uh, this would be the third bound of Israel. But the fourth has been changed from wilderness to the ends of the earth. Uh, here we can see the original in Exodus 23, 31. I will set your border from the Red Sea to the Sea of the Philistines and from the wilderness to the Euphrates. Uh, so now, looking forward to the future here, there is no limit to whose God people are under the king. This echoes the hope of Psalm 72, 8, which has the same pattern of giving the borders of Israel, but changing one to being the ends of the earth. But it also looks forward to Christianity, where all people are brought into the family of Abraham. The switch to the first person here indicates that the Lord himself is acting. The triumph will be peaceful. As we can see, the, the war horses are are taken away, the chariots are taken away, the battle bow is cut off. It won't be a violent revolution as some Jews were hoping for when they were under Roman rule during the time of Jesus. This idea of a peaceful triumph is echoed throughout numerous books of the Old Testament. In verse 11, we come to the blood of the covenant. Uh, this harkens back to Genesis 15, where the covenant with Abraham was sealed by blood, Exodus 24, where the covenant with Moses was sealed by blood. And it looks forward to the new covenant, which is sealed by the blood of Christ. The prisoners, that is, us sinners, are set free. Whom the Son frees is free indeed. Verse 12 is a tricky one. The Hebrew grammar here is on, which has led to a number of different suggested amendations, but let's just take it as it's translated. Return to your stronghold, O prisoners of hope. The idea here then is that the prisoners, uh, the people suffering, us sinners, can confidently return home because we know that the Lord will triumph. We know God will prevail so we can relax, so to speak. That's where our reading ended, but the thought continues on to verse 17. So let me just briefly touch on the rest of the passage. In verse 10, as we saw, it speaks of the disarming of Israel. But now we see that God himself is not disarmed. Rather, the two kingdoms will be his uh, weapons. From the nation of Israel will arise the Christian faith the faith that will conquer the world. An epic battle will ensue uh, in verses 14 and 15, but this battle isn't going to be a literal one, but rather a spiritual one. The soldiers of this battle will be filled up like a bowl, and they will roar as if they are drunk with wine. In the New Testament, when people are filled with the Spirit, they are accused of being drunk with wine. On that very day, Yahweh himself, the Lord God, will save us. He will save the soldiers, the sinners who have been saved by the king. We are, we are now like jewels of a crown. For how great is his goodness and how great is his beauty. Amen. Each week, a group of us Christians gather on YouTube to study God's word. We read through four passages, typically one each from the Law or Prophets, Psalms, 
epistles, and gospels. Then we open it up for discussion. I give a prepared teaching on one of the passages and then open it up for additional discussion. We then close by praying for one another. Both YouTube chat and live video participation via Zoom are welcome. If that sounds interesting to you, click here to subscribe to the Reasoned Worship channel. The readings and time are announced in advance, or just show up and let the Spirit lead you. If you would like to see the full session from which this teaching comes, click here. I'd love to see you join us in the discussion this weekend.